So that'll be 235. Dude, I don't have my wallet. Can I pay you back later? This isn't a charity. I'm good for it. I'll come right back. Hey, you know what? I got this. Okay. And a pack of cigarettes? A pack of smokes. Parliament. Hey, I have money. I can pay you back. It's totally cool. It's on me. Don't be a fucking hero. I'm Mickey. I'm Gus. Follow me. <laughs> what do you do? I'm a program manager at radio station. I could never date a co-worker. What a bad idea. Yeah, what a bad idea. Maybe we should both quit. <laughs> I'm joking. One of us quit. I'm kidding. You know what's good for a hangover? We. Fluids. Oh. You're really good at that. <laughs> You're like a 40-year-old, 12-year-old. My last girlfriend, she hated it when I ate fast food. Is that why you guys broke up? She cheated on me. Maybe now would be a good time to get the boxes out of my house. It's just boxes of DVDs. They're Blu-rays. Okay, well, it's just shit you can watch online. These Blu-rays have, like, exclusive special features, you bitch. My ex, I think he's still really hung up on me. She's a fucking whore. I told you not to call her that. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, Thank you for defending my honor. I am the one that called you a whore. Nobody ever just pulls you aside and goes, hey, just so you know, relationships are fucking bullshit. I just think we're two nice people who gave it our best shot. Anyway, I'm into chubby guys. I just keep believing in this fucking lie that a relationship evolves and gets better. Where do these lies come from? Fucking movies. Pretty woman? Fuck you! Sweet Home Alabama? Ugh. Lies? With Harry Met Sally? Fucking lies. lies? Homeland season three? Very confusing. Get it out of my place! Oh. Where are you from? Brookings, South Dakota. My mom always tells me I should date a Midwestern boy because they're really sweet and honest. Oh, really? Well, uh, tell your mom to go fuck herself. I'm kidding. It's a joke. I didn't. I got it. Gillian, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I'm going to say something right off the bat that's going to sound a little kiss-assy, and I'm sorry, but this is the third time I've seen you in the past couple months, and every time I've seen you, you have incredible style. You always look amazing, and all the crew always goes when you walk away. She goes, "Great style." Oh, thank everyone you. always says it like that. It's great style. Oh well, thanks to my stylist, Callie Rinker, because I don't own anything I'm wearing. Shout out! <laughs> uh, thanks so much for being here. I love this show, and one of the sort of downsides of loving the show is that you always end up saying, "I love love." Yes. And it's it, you're like, oh, I don't know how else to say. It. But I, I I truly love this show. Can you talk about getting a role like this and sort of getting those early scripts and being kind of like, what, I get to do this? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, Community had just been canceled by NBC, our first time being canceled, and I was very sad. <laughs> Wait, before, is that, sorry, let's backtrack yeah, a second sure. here, because I need that timeline. The is timeline's confusing very confusing, yes. Is that canceled before, just before going to Yahoo? Yes, or canceled? so we did five seasons for NBC, okay. we were canceled by NBC, we all thought the show was dead for all intents and purposes. It was gone. I mourned it. I cried. Um, I got cast on Girls. I came to New York to start shooting that, and I got a call saying, Judd Apatow wants to meet with you. I was like, what is this about? Um, and yeah, and so then he said, uh, we've been working on this show, and we want you to play this part. And I read the scripts, and I was so excited. And um, it was sort of exactly what I'd been hoping to do post-community, which was like a smaller cast and um, a part that I felt was kind of in that dramedy world and gave me the range to do both comedy and more serious stuff. So it was a it was a wonderful moment for me of something just sort of falling in my lap. Your character is definitely a character of extremes, but at the same time, the show is so good at finding elements within those extremes that are very relatable, I think, for anybody who's ever felt like that or dated a person kind of like that. Do you find yourself relating to this character at all? Do you find yourself at many times being kind of like, oh, she's actually not that extreme. I, I might do this myself. Well, I mean, the external behaviors, the extremes of this character are kind of dissimilar from myself. Like, I don't drink. I've never done drugs. I'm kind of a homebody. Uh, I like rules. I'm more like Gus in real life. Um, but then when you really kind of strip all of that away, that sort of surface stuff, I've definitely had periods of time in my life where things aren't going right in, in a series of bad relationships and I'm blaming everyone else and I had to sit back and go, actually, it's kind of my fault too. 
And uh, that's a hard realization to have. But once you have that, then you have the potential to actually change the way things are going in your life. So that's kind of the moment in which we find this character. And I definitely went through that myself. And absolutely. And I think one of the great things about the show and a testament to sort of being able to do serialized television is that that realization doesn't come in the pilot for this character. It doesn't come in the second or third episode. Like that sort of deep, profound realization that someone has to have of themselves almost takes as long as it might take for a person to have in reality, which is over the course of many months or a year of screwing up, which is uh, absolutely one of the, the delights of the show is that it doesn't feel the need to hit those very obvious television beats right away. Yeah. Well, I also think they smartly thought some of the fun of a new relationship is that everything feels tentative, um, very minor things can feel life and death. And once you're actually in a relationship, the, the kind of life and death stakes of it are taken away, but why not explore that? Like, we have a whole episode where he's waiting for me to text back, yeah. you know, which is like a real thing. You know, you send that text and then you have that incredible anxiety and the longer it takes for someone to respond, the more sure you've, you are that you've screwed it all up and it's all over and, you know, you really watch him churn in that anxiety for an entire day and then you see my character at the end of a very long day go like, oh yeah, I forgot to write him back and just text him back like it was nothing. And it's like, and she has the flip side of yeah, that a few episodes later, totally. right? Where she ends up getting into her obsessive mode, yes. which is a bit, I hesitate to judge, but a bit more unhealthy, I think. Than oh, yes. I think it is the beginning of her realizing that she perhaps uh, has a sex and love addiction. So, yes, I think hers is a bit more extreme than his. She realizes that, but then she also does, and I think he does as well, what people do at the beginning of relationships, which is test boundaries a little bit. Like, when is this person going to be like, that's enough? Mm -hmm. No more of, I, li I like you a lot, but if you keep doing that, you're not going to be around much longer. Yeah, and I think his character is a quote-unquote nice guy, and perhaps maybe initially Mickey thinks she can get away with some stuff with a nice guy, <laughs> which isn't the nice thing for her to do. But yeah, I think both, you know, they're both sort of testing each other out, and um, I think that, you know, when you meet someone who's very dissimilar from people you've dated in the past, you have a lot of, like, questions. Either, like, this is the healthiest thing I've ever done, or this is going to, like implode very quickly and so I think they're both unsure of what this could be because just look at the poster those two have never dated people like each other before <laughs> <laughs> that's what a lot of people said I think when they saw the trailer too they went come on come on those two uh, with a show like this, and I think it happens a lot with Judd Apatow uh, projects, be it Trainwreck or Knocked Up or even things that he sort of he's also produced, is that it feels so personal for the audience, almost like you're watching a stand-up comic talk about their personal life or things that you think are their personal life. Just going back to my question of how many things do you relate to about this character, how often do you find that people sort of equate your actual life now to this character or the character to the creators of the show? Because I know that... Leslie is yeah. Paul's wife, and they wrote it together. Uh, I think if you know me in real life, you know that I'm really not much like the character at all. And I'm sorry to disappoint those people who don't know me who are th hoping that I'm like the character. Um, she's way Wait, cooler than I am. Oh, <laughs> no. I know. I'm just like, I like to be home and in bed by 10. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I am not, I never really had a wild child phase. My rebellion was much smaller. I like cut school in high school to go to a museum and I'm not even kidding. And you didn't even enjoy the museum that day too. You were just too nervous too all day. Too racked with things. And I got caught and in a lot of trouble with my mother. So I didn't even. How did like, you get caught? Well, they called and left a message on the home answering machine and I thought I could uh, call and erase it before she got to it, but oh. she beat me to the draw. So I, for whatever reason, was going to my mom's office that day after school, and she uh, was like crying when I got there and told she me was I was. Crying? She told me I was a disappointment, and I had to apologize to all of my teachers for letting them down. And then I, <laughs> I went. I used to uh, like do work study in the English department, and I went to the secretary in the English department. And I was like, my mom says I'm supposed to apologize to you for coming school yesterday, and she's like, you never do anything wrong. You're a senior. You've already been accepted to college. Fuck it. I was like, yeah. You had a teacher who was essentially like, cut school. Yeah. Do something. I, Sow some oats. I think she saw how tightly wound I was and was like, you need this. <laughs> So, so opposite for me in high school, which is like, just stop. Just calm down. Please stop yelling at us and ditching school, please. Really? Yes. Oh, oh I needed a friend like you. 
No, absolutely not. You did. You would have been in so much more trouble. Uh, so when you got the script, you met Paul, and his. A lot of people think that the show is really based off of him and his wife. She was a writer for girls, a very personal uh, sort of internet writer as well. She's written a book about, I think, her personal life, right? Dear Diary, a book about yeah, her struggles with addiction and yeah, recovery. How much do you end up sort of basing your character off of her when you meet her? Do you try really hard not to do that? The one thing I was trying to do, which is that when she smokes, she blows the smoke out of the side of her mouth, like, and everybody just kept telling me it looked really weird when I did it, so I just dropped it. And that was a, that was a, I, you know, I figured very early on the best thing to do was to really just take Mickey as a character in the script as a separate, her own individual person. And, you know, I didn't want to be doing an imitation of anyone. And my one little attempted gesture <laughs> did not go over well. So I just very quickly kind of dropped that. Did you show up on set and do that in the first scene? And someone yeah. was like, what are you doing? Well, also, because I don't smoke in real life, I think they were, like, hyper-analyzing me as a smoker and being like, that doesn't look real. That's not how people smoke. Stop doing that. So when I was like, people were like, nope, 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 don't do that anymore. And I was like, That's true. So often in movies and TV, when people don't smoke, you see you kind of like... <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, well, and uh, it's, like, really true when you actually do inhale. You're like, Ugh. <laughs> I realized I hadn't been inhaling. Even with the stage cigarettes? What are oh, they, like, yeah, herbal, they're, they're like disgusting. herbal things, right? They are disgusting. So you'd rather just smoke a real cigarette? I smoke the herbal ones. No, I, I smoke the herbal ones. I'm a, I had never smoked in my life until I was cast in this movie called Blackbird years ago. Um, and so I started to smoke for that, and then I smoked for a brief, brief period of time, which my dear friend Joan in the back is nodding along. She remembers my brief rebellion of smoking. And um, Wait, Can it, I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Did your mom ever find out? That oh, yeah, she briefly? knew. Yeah. She kn How did that go? She, you know, I was... Did she cry again? I, she probably did, privately. I think she was relieved that it was not long-lasting. Um, but I was like, I think I like smoking cigarettes. So, I, you know, when this part came ar around, I was like, not worth it to risk it, smoking a real cigarette. I should stick to the disgusting herbal ones. It's such a weird thing when you decide that you like smoking cigarettes, be it as, like, a teenager or in your early 20s or something, because... People are just telling you yeah. all the time, it's, this is the worst thing for you, do not do it. But you go, oh, I didn't die, and I kind of like that. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's okay. My, my vanity is the only thing that saves me. I was like, <laughs> yeah. it's not good for you, your skin in the long run, so I'll probably quit this. I, qu I quit for a brief period of time and saw my teeth whiten up, and I was like, done. <laughs> never, never smoking again. That's how vain I got about it. You uh, have an incredible year this year. Outside of Love, you have two movies that premiered at festivals and did incredibly well. Mike Birbiglia's Don't Think Twice, Dimitri Martin's Dean. This is uh, incredible. Was coming off of Community while sort of losing the show a sad thing also freed you up a little bit to sort of start doing a lot of other projects? Yeah, I think, you know, we had been on the verge of cancellation for so long that it kind of instilled this fear in all of us, this fear of the unknown and what would happen to all of us once the show went away. For a lot of us, it was our first big, significant job. And then I think once the worst happens and you're still standing, you're like, oh, I'll be okay. You know, and uh, so I think, yeah, you sort of get more time in your schedule and that, that space clears in your head to be like, it's gonna be all right. So I don't know how that affected my choices of material or work or some of it's just luck of things coming out around the same time, but... Um, yeah, it was an interesting thing, I think, for all of us when we finally were canceled. When, when is the movie? Huh? Six seasons in a movie. Oh, yeah, I know. Ask Dan Herman. Um, <laughs> he, he told me that I was on The Daily Show a couple months ago, and Trevor Noah and I, like, direct a camera, were like, Dan, write the script. And I never in a million years thought about him actually watching that. And he's like, I've gotten used to a lot of surreal aspects of this business, but having you and Trevor Noah yell at me through a camera on to me and the in my living room to write a script was truly bizarre. Still don't think he's working on the script, but I'm sure um, he needs a bit of a break. I mean Rick and Morty is in production right now, so and I And it's and, an incredible show. Yes, yeah. Yes. And you know, um and great minds. Um and so I, I think he's very busy. But what was it like for you? Uh, I'm curious, being I mean outside of working with this cast that you love on community and working with Dan who's just one of the best writers working this atmosphere of like could get canceled at any time, people rallying around the show in this like very positive, but I think just very strange way. It's just so strange for human beings to rally around a network television. That was our mascot, show. the human beings. Yeah. 
Um, what was that? What, what did that feel like? What was that like? I mean, it was moving. I remember going to Comic Con for the first time. And I don't think we realized that we had that kind of devoted fan base, small but mighty, but very devoted. And I remember coming out, and we were in a small hall. I didn't know the difference. I didn't know what Hall H was at that point. But we came out, and they gave us a standing ovation, and I started crying because, I mean, you can't... How many seasons in were you at that point? One. It was, we'd, we'd done one, and we were about to start shooting season two, and um, I, I don't think we knew. I don't think we understood that the show meant something like that to a core group of fans. And you can't take it for granted because I may never have something like that ever again that really speaks to people in that way that motivates them to not just watch something but organize. They were like tweeting the sponsors who had ads during Community on NBC. <laughs> they would like list, they would amongst themselves list out all the sponsors and write them tweets saying like, I can't remember who they are. Dasani, thank you so much for your support of community. I look forward to buying some bottled water. I mean, like, they were, they had, like, a sing-along outside 30 Rock, you know. Um, they organized their own convention for the show called Communicon, which they did three times in two years. They had a fan art show in L.A., and people sent in art from around the world. They had costume contests and a band playing songs from our show. I mean... You can't expect that, you know, and so I really tried to appreciate it as it was happening because who knows if I'll ever experience that again. What do you think it was about the show that, that uh, created that? Well, I think the show was about a group of misfit underdog outsiders and we became that as a show on NBC. Yeah. So I think people both identified with the character and felt, you know, protective of the show itself and I think that, you know, um, we were sort of like at the beginning of shows with an online presence. And so the fact that, you know, Dan Harmon was very active on Twitter and engaging with the fans. And um, I think the fact that, you know, people were starting to watch our show whenever they wanted to in the ways in which people now watch all television, but that was still a little bit unusual. Um, I don't know. They just felt like it was theirs, I think. And also kind of felt like a secret because uh, not a lot of people knew we were on the air. <laughs> so uh, if you liked Community, it sort of was like you were in a club with all the other fans. It was um, felt underground in a way, even though we were on a network. And it was also, uh, you were a group of misfits that were also steeped in like pop culture references and, and geek reference, nerdy references and stuff that I think that also fueled a fair amount of that as well, right? Sure, 80% of which I did not get. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not a pop culture fanatic? I mean, I had never or seen Die Hard when we shot the paintball episode of season one, so I did not understand that they were references. <laughs> that is, I mean, if everyone, if someone says I haven't seen Die Hard and people know it's like, oh my God, yeah. it's okay. Like it's. I've now it's, seen it, guys, don't worry. I now understand why Joel wasn't wearing shoes. Um, it's a good movie, but it, like, yeah. it's a late 80s action. It's a great no, late 80s action. It's a great movie. Alan Rickman, fabulous. I did not know that... Danny Pudi saying, come with me if you don't want to get paint on your clothes was a reference to a line in something, you know. Terminator. Yes, exactly. Now I know. <laughs> and together we would pool our resources as a cast and tell each other what all the references were. <laughs> I got the My Dinner with Andre reference, okay? I got that That's one. That's where you landed. That's you, my wheelhouse. You, you, yes. You were like... Can we get more art, uh, references to art house films from yeah. the 80s and early 90s, please? Totally. Thank you. And I had I was telling guys, like, remember in Waiting for Guffman when they have the My Dinner with Andre action figures that Christopher Guest is selling at the end? Um, that I got, but I did not get the Terminator or Die Hard reference. And the remains of the day lunchbox. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, waiting Loved for it. Guffman. Yes. Well, uh, so you're moving into season two. You guys are shooting season two of Love right now. After having done a season of a character who feels incredibly personal and that I think as an actress you probably end up feeling very, very close to, do you try to have any say when it comes to the writing? Do you talk to them about where they're going? Do you, I mean, I'd assume you, it's a delicate balance, yeah. but just sort of cl creative collaboration? I mean, I never want to tell them what show I think they should write instead of the show that they're writing, which is, I don't think, a nice way to approach writers. Like get um, a script and be like, nah. Nah. I mean, I have too much respect for writing to do that, but I certainly have had times when I was like, maybe go a little bit deeper with that, or maybe there's a, another reason why she's doing that, or there's a, there's a third layer of motivation going on beyond that. And uh, Paul and all the writers are, have been incredibly kind and receptive to my ideas, but I really try and, you know, stay in my lane and not 
be like, you should write an episode in which, like, I win a beauty contest, you know, I'm like not like trying to You'd basically um, be pulling a, a Gus at the end of the first season. Showing yes, up in the writer's room. You're freaking out in the writer's room. I've never flipped out in the writer's room. They just set fire to everybody. Or the totally. They love that, right? That's what they want to hear. Yeah. And you guys, uh, you, you and Paul uh, had to shoot some fairly awkward love scenes. Yes. Oh, boy. What what's worse, shooting a, a a love scene where you don't get to address the awkwardness of like of actually making a love scene or sex in general, or one where you actually have to act out the awkwardness? Oh oh, probably if you don't get to acknowledge the awkwardness, it's right. worse. You have to shoot like a weird Top Gun style love yeah. scene or something. But I always think of what was that Charlie Sheen movie where he fries an egg on her stomach? Um, what it, hot, shots. Yeah, hot shots? Yeah. That's my kind of sex scene. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. And it was funny because uh, Steve Buscemi directed one of our episodes, um, the episode where we go on a date to the Magic Castle and we have like our first um, romantic I intercourse love that episode. episode. Yeah, they, and uh, it was hilarious because they kept giving Steve Buscemi alternate lines for us to say and he was having to come in and say these really explicit things to us. Wait, really? <laughs> yes, and he's such a, like, a gentle... Soul, and he had this very like non judgmental, like, so, um, maybe you, I can't, I'm not good at impressions, but maybe, um, you can say, you can say anything you want here. Oh, God, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yes, yes, yes. They're like, maybe you could, maybe Gus, you know, Paul, you could say to her, I could lick your pussy. I don't know. <laughs> He said everything in the tone of like, it's a possibility, perhaps, no judgment here. If that's what that character wants to say to that character, then no biggie. And it was like, oh my God, this is so surreal. Both this is incredibly awkward and this is Steve Buscemi saying this <laughs> to us right now. So it was like... I bet that kind of helped though, because he's so disarming. Yes, and he's an actor and you know, it's like there's always... He's, you know, I'm sure been in similarly awkward Boardwalk Empire. My God, you know all those scenes. So, oh, yeah. he's been there as in the first yeah, season. yeah, like crazy sex, a lot of sex, lot, a lot, lot. of, a lot of Steve Buscemi fucking in Boardwalk Empire. Lot. Just kind of a odd choice. Lot. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it it there is a certain level of comfort when it's another actor who's directing you through those scenes, and you know that they've they've been there. Can we talk about that episode for a second? Because the episode where you go to Magic Castle, I feel like that's a situation that anybody who's been on a date before has had, where you take your, the, the person you're on a date with to something that you love, that is a sacred experience for you. Sacred, a uh, bit of an exaggeration or hyperbolic yeah, word. Not but, by much for Gus. Yeah, yeah. but like, I'm, it's like I'm a film buff, right? And like I love movies, and I will take a date to uh, like a film at Film Forum or something. And the sort of minor version of what you do in that is they move around a little bit. They kind of twitch because they're not really engaged with the movie the way that I am. And I start judging myself for bringing them and maybe judging them. And you guys elevated it to a very, uh, I would say, pathological level for your character. Yeah. Was that a turning point for you doing those scenes and getting that script for your character? Because as a viewer, it was a turning point for me and how I understood her. Well, I... It's interesting because in that episode, you know, the, the, the Magic Castle in L.A. is this mysterious place. You have to be a magician to go there or know a magician. <laughs> so everyone's sort of like, have you gone to the Magic Castle? Did you go to the Magic Castle? Um, and you're like, no, have you gone? You know, they got a really strict dress code. Yeah, my friend showed up without a jacket and they wouldn't let him in. You know, so it's like sort of built up in LA as this place where they've got a lot of rules and not a lot of people get to go there. It is what it is in, in that. Yes, it's, wow. it's like that. That's not an exaggeration. And I know people who have been turned away for not having a tie on or a jacket or, you know, all those sorts of things. And you have to eat a meal there. You're not allowed to come unless you buy a dinner there and all these rules. And, um, but it was interesting because there's a scene after we leave where we're driving and Mickey starts to sort of defend herself going, I liked things, but just not the things you liked. And that was all kind of an improvised scene between me and Paul where I was like, I got to stick up for Mickey a little bit here because she did enjoy things about the experience. They just weren't the same exact things that he wanted her to like. Or if she was having fun doing something, he's like, no, no, the fun thing is over here rather than being like, oh, she's enjoying this thing that I didn't think she'd really like her. It's not my favorite thing. So I think it's both. I think the shoe's on both feet. Like, both Mickey is not being a good sport about it. 
and Gus is trying to like curate this experience so tightly that he's not able to deviate from the, the plan he had in his head. Absolutely, and without generalizing too much, I thought it was a really great depiction of the way certain men and certain women sort of handle things, because I definitely find myself trying to be the curator and sort of make sure that the person, you know, uh, men, men sometimes, I feel like, or at least me, watching a movie with my girlfriend will be like, did you see that? Did you see that funny thing right there? She's like, yeah, I saw it. Leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> like, you know, and I'm like, want to make sure that they get it. And that episode caught that so, so perfectly. It was so smart. Do you find with the show that, like, every episode you're just like, oh, what an amazing observation, once again, as to how men and women deal with these situations. Yeah, or just relationships in general. I mean, I think that there are things that I've seen my friends go through, things that I've gone through, you know. Um, and I think that, you know, people get in their own way a lot. And, you know, I have friends who are dating and it's like, like that episode with like waiting for people to text back. It's like, it's been nine hours since I texted. That means it's over. And it's like so much pressure. And it's like, why is it so fragile at the beginning that it can be ruined by one weird text message? You know, but it's like, I don't know what it is if we're like looking for reasons to get out early on or people are, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I do feel like it sort of captured that like, Ooh, did I ruin it? Did I ruin it? Did I ruin it? Which is just like a terrible place to be in. Cause then you're like on a date trying to like all calm, cool and collected and inside. You're like, ah, it's over already. So I, it's, I mean, I don't know how any of us do it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn it over to the audience for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Hey Gillian, uh, huge fan of, uh, <laughs> hey there. Uh, huge fan of community. Uh, still hold on to hope that you guys uh, do a movie one day. Me too. Uh, so for this uh, new show that you're doing, uh, I know it touches on the reality of your relationships. So I just want to ask, like, what is your approach to maintaining a relationship? Hmm. My approach. I like where you went because I thought you were going to go, are you dating anyone? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? Can you like, <laughs> it's about relationships. I was curious. <laughs> are you? Um, uh, I think... Um, honest communication is a good foundation for any relationship, and you got to be honest with yourself about your own flaws and try and communicate clearly about what you need, and also maybe not wait until you're in a fight to bring up something you've been having an issue with. Not so much easier things... said than done. I know, but it's like, <laughs> you know, in a calm moment, maybe bring that thing up that's been building up inside of you rather than, like, yelling it in the middle of a fight after six months. Wait, what's going on, Gillian? Is everything? <laughs> you know, I've seen you three times in the last couple months, and you didn't even. This is the blah, first blah, time blah, you brought blah, up blah. my style, God. Yeah, damn. exactly. And I complimented you on your Reeboks last time. <laughs> it's true. She did. She did. <laughs> Whatever. Next question. Next question. Whatever. Hi. I didn't see Die Hard either, so I'm just yes. Thank you. Throwing that out there. Anyway, so my question is. What are your biggest pet peeves when it comes to like somebody you're dating? Because me personally, I hate when people chew loud, and I hate snoring. Like, oh, really? Uh, yes. My friend, I think it's a condition where she cannot stand the sound of people eating. Period. It like to the point where it's hard for her to go out to dinner with anyone, dating friend, otherwise, or just be in the room with people chewing. I think I'm obsessively punctual, so if I probably dated somebody who was very late all the time, that would probably drive me nuts. But I am like so extreme on being early, I've showed up to red carpet events before the photographers got there and had to like hang out inside, and they're like, the red carpet is ready for you now, Gillian, <laughs> you can go back out. So I could probably work on being less uh, early. Next question. How's it going, Gillian? Hi. Uh, this show's one of my favorite shows on Netflix, and the delivery of your and Gus lines are just amazing. Uh, but my question is, do you ever uh, have a tough time um, getting into character in between seasons of the shows that you work on? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like, first week back does kind of feel like first week back to school. Like, And especially, um, this was my first time starting a new show in, like, six years. So thankfully, we had two weeks of rehearsal before we started shooting to kind of get into the world of the show, but definitely the first, like we shot the first two episodes together, we block shot them, so it would be alternating between scenes from episode one and two, and it was very much like, is that the tone of the show? Is that the show? Is that the show? And I felt like we did a lot of takes those first couple of weeks, because you're really trying to figure it out, and you know, and sometimes it's tricky to discover tone, like what's too much, 
you know, you don't want to feel like you're pushing for the laughs on a show like this. You just kind of got to trust that the writing's funny and it, people will get the joke. So, yeah, it's it was certainly like starting the show up. I probably had more anxiety than I thought I would. Next question. Hi, thank you for being here. Since this series is um, revolved around love and dating, my question is, what was the worst pickup line someone has used to try to get your attention? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I went to the White House Correspondents' Dinner last year and someone telling me they were like a, a Republican lobbyist. <laughs> I was like, eh. And he'd also, he also said... Um, Only a Republican lobbyist would think that would work. Yeah. Like. Well, he also was also clearly just lying to me right off the bat because I went to this party. It was the first party I'd been to that night. And he's like, I saw you at the party before this and I noticed those shoes. I was like, I wasn't there. So you're lying. Oh, man. Republicans, bad everywhere, all around, all the time. Next question. Um, I've heard people say that you can't be a happy comedian and I was wondering what you think about that. Well, I'm not a comedian, so I don't have to burden myself with that. But um, I think that... It's possible to be, do I know many? I don't know. Uh, um, I think it's the same way of like, I felt like in my 20s, I thought I had to have a lot of terrible experiences to be a good actor. I had to like bank up a lot of heartbreak and disaster to have things to draw upon. But then I was like, life is going to hand those to you anyway. So I don't need to seek them out anymore. Um, I think that... Uh, I think you could be a happy comedian, but probably you would have to like uh, mine your own psyche a little bit deeper, perhaps. I don't know. There's just life is going to be hard anyway, so I don't think you have to make yourself miserable. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. I'm glad I'm in therapy. There are, there, there are happy comedians though. Like meet Key and Peele. They're like the oh, happiest, yeah. nicest and, people yes. in the world. Keegan and Jordan are very happy and delightful people to be around. Uh, Gillian, I have to let you go. But again, I love love. It's so nice to see you again. The show comes back sometime next year, and you can watch the first season on Netflix right now. In July, you have a movie coming out as well called Don't Think Twice, yes. the Mike Birbiglia movie. And there's another movie, Dean, that you're in coming out. Not. Release date not set for that, though, right? Yes. Uh, Megan? Oh, no, Megan's not here. Michelle? No? Okay. If, you, I don't know. if you love Gillian Jacobs, which you should, there are so many ways to watch her do incredible stuff right now. Gillian, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you.